Good evening and uh, thanks for being here. I see so many familiar faces and I'm so thrilled about this event tonight because this is a special man and I would like to tell you something about him before he's coming to sit here and we're going to have a conversation. So, connoisseur, musician, preservationist, curator, writer, and designer. Michael Boyd has demonstrated that good taste is not in the eye of the beholder, but rather is a cultural commodity that takes a lifetime to develop, to perfect, to bring to the absolute. Living with good taste is a vision. It's a commitment, a discipline to respect and constantly explore the universal expression of aesthetics. Michael's taste for the objects of the pioneers of the modern movement has guided him through his eternal expedition into the learning, appreciation, and connoisseurship of design. So this evening, we are here to celebrate Michael's new book, Millennium Modern, living in design, which illustrates his holistic design practice. And why Millennium Modern? Signifying 20 years before and 20 years after the millennium. So Michael, please. Thank you very much. You know, Michael, when I first met you, I remember I asked you, um, like, okay, all this design and houses and beautiful, where this come from? And then you told me that you were a composer. So look what I'm starting. I'm starting with the Super Bowl of 1996. I think my best introduction to the 1996 Super Bowl is um, we were driving with the kids and my kids said, Dad, what, uh, what does heyday mean? And, well, you know, heyday is, you know, when you're sort of at your peak glory. And they said, Dad, when was your heyday? And I said, well, if you must know, 1996. So um, I was a composer for film and television. Uh, I worked for Levi's and Nike and Coca-Cola and all the car companies. And my hobby was uh, collecting design and, and studying vintage design and the history of architecture. And somewhere along the way, my vocation and my hobby sort of flipped. I was very interested in uninflected uh, design, uh, you know, which uh, Mies and uh, constructivist rectilinear design and then highly inflected personal design like uh, Carlo Molino that's almost borders on the uh, eccentric and idiomatics. So I want to start with this chair. Do you still have it? Uh, you know, I don't know if I have the actual one probably. Okay. I probably like upgraded as a collector's first So party. this was Over your years, first, this was your that, first yeah. chair, Eames chair, and where did you, where did you see it? Where did well, you buy it? Well, I grew up in Berkeley in the 60s and, and 70s, so that means it was a festival of brown, you know, like everything was velour and macrame, and uh, of course the first time I saw like a space age, you know, white freeform plastic chair, I lost my mind because I thought it was the greatest thing I'd ever seen because it was so exotic, you know. So obviously when I came out of this festival of brown and uh, saw this chair right here, I, I saw it at the, at the Berkeley flea market. But then I took it home and immediately realized I needed to get rid of everything else and just keep that chair. The chair stays, everything else goes. All my friends came over and they're like, oh, this is cool. I'm like, great, take it with you when you go. In, in our love for design and aesthetics, we always have this turning point, this one event that really changed the course of our life and thought, and that was yours. Yeah, but uh, then my mother, Zelda, took me to uh, the Breuer show at MoMA, and it just completely changed my life for many reasons. The work, of course, is so... Uh, pristine and stellar, you know, conceptually, but also I had no idea that this could be collected and there could be a survey and then a narrative between objects. I, I, I knew that about painting, but I didn't know that that was possible uh, with kind of a alphabet, if you will, uh, of chairs. And, and you know what, the, what is amazing to me is that it was 1981, so how many years? Um, 40 years ago. 
Is it that much? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Oh, I'll believe and, you if you say and that. And you still have the same taste, and you still love that. I That's do. That's what you love. So yeah, you didn't yeah. move away from that. Well, yeah. I mean, it's been sort of a pivot, I would say, more of anything else. Mm -hmm. uh, again, the you know the simplest music is usually the most moving. You know, Samuel Barbara Adagio for strings or Ravel Debussy. Um, the uh, and I feel the same with design. But I also see that there is you have a special love for furniture created by architects. Okay, so if we look at like this chair by Miss Van der Rohe or this table by uh, Friedrich uh, Kiesler, these were all architects, and there is very strong ide architectural identity to furniture created by architects. Is well, this something that you are uh, related to? Yeah, I mean, it wasn't really conscious until I figured out what the pattern was. I mean, it didn't start that I read, like, I think I'll go after architects' chairs. It was more that there seemed to be a lot of decorative, you know, cladding and additions and kind of uh, unnecessary components. It's actually really hard to do something sincere, simple, honest, and great. And the kind of deadpan, simplest version of structure and system and form turned out to be architects. So, so what was it like in the in those days in the '90s? You, how did you buy these things? I mean, today they are extremely expensive, and they are you can find them in you know like particular auction houses, some uh, handful galleries, dealers. Like for example, the dealer name Brian Kish who is right here with us, or Paul Donzella. Uh, but what was it then? Where did you find these pieces? These are masterpieces. Well, in the 80s and 90s, I uh, worked in New York as a musician. I would go to the 26th Street Fleet Market and follow Andy Warhol to see what he would put in his bag <laughs> with his entourage. I, you know, every time I went to Fiorucci, he was in there too. I'm like, I don't understand how he can be in all these places. But I was fascinated um, by the narrative that gets built in collecting. And so... At that time, um, this stuff was just kind of uh, uh, given up for dead. So it was really like scrap salvage, and a lot of it uh, hardly had a cost associated with it. And it was only, that's when I really started to get into collecting, it was probably late 80s, is when I noticed that the group of them was more powerful than the one alone. In the, the peak of your collection, you had like hundreds and hundreds of pieces. Right? I think that's true, yes. Yeah, that's what I heard. <laughs> I seem to re remember that's that, what yes. I read yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, now the truth of the matter is in 2022, there's a lot, uh, a lot of newer things that do have design excellence that are affordable. And in the 80s, there was none of that. There was either the most garish, horrendous thing you've ever seen or this incredibly humble stuff that was singing inaudibly to me. Um, that's no longer the case because I, I was so um, determined to preserve the legacy of these misunderstood pieces. So, you know, let's go now move to your houses because then you moved from collecting pieces of furniture, small pieces, into collecting houses. And well, I want to start... Restoring houses. I, I've never collected houses. Okay. Restoring and living with them. And Peter Palumbo collects houses. Yeah, I collect chairs. That's part of the reason why I collected chairs, is actually it's portable architecture, you know? But do you buy very important and very good pieces of architecture? To so I want to start with this to one, save with them the triplex. For a, for a, so yeah. the triplex is in what I think New York's most beautiful street. I mean, that's, what, that's my taste. Beekman Place. It's just so gorgeous. And that particular house, Gabby, I don't want to just ignore you. Gabby is here too, and she's Michael's wife and partner in everything that they have done. And, and the two of you uh, moved to 23 Beekman to the, what is known as the triplex, which is the, was the home of architect Paul Rudolph. Did you fall in love with this house right away? What, what was it? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's a, I, I would have to say it's a sort of a dazzling sculpture that by the time you have really 
experienced it and excavated, um, it, it's clear that it's more of an experimental lab and not really a finished piece of architecture. And that's as it was. I mean, that's the history of that building. So it was a lab. It was an experimental lab. Um, he ran out of funds, so he would start making things out of uh, plastics and laminates when he could no longer afford white Thassos marble. So it was this dazzling sculpture. But I remember here, as you look at the living room, it had mirrored mylar everywhere when we got there. So it was a kind of a 70s, kind of a disco aesthetic. And it was all delaminating and damaged, so it had to come off to go back on anyway. He lived in the building since uh, the 60s, but uh, began later on the, on the triplex. So it started as a kind of international style white uh, steel structure, very similar to his work in Florida. Um, but, but Paul Antonelli said about this house, famously said, a beautiful nightmare. Yeah, it's a perfect description, and it's why I put it in the book. I mean, it set me on a whole different course in my life, I, you know, because when it was not a successful stint as a family home, but was a highly successful, you know, Bach organ fugue, you know, what I find really interesting is that <laughs> you were the first people to live there after Paul yes, Rudolph, yeah. but not the last because that apartment keeps coming on the market. Yeah, because over people are and dazzled and then they're over it. Yes. Know. So let's go now to uh, one of your heroes, uh, Jean Prouvé. So what is it about Jean Prouvé that makes him a hero to you? French style is something that's so hard to crystallize, I think, because I, I really do have some guilty pleasures that do go into decorative, non-architectural areas, and it's almost always French. Like, I just really think that French style is, is the most compelling style for me because there is still a lot of architectonic quality in the designs. Uh, and I think for Prouvé, Again, it's that engineering made visible. We don't even know why we're so attracted to it. But when you look at the body of work and how consistently beautifully made it is and how delicate the designs are, and how, but yet how sturdy it is. But I think that that's really what it is, is that it's you know, engineering made visible. So let's look now at the house that you're living right now. Uh, you're living in, the, in a house by Oscar Niemeyer, who was a Brazilian modernist, who, because he was communist, he was never allowed to visit America. And he created this house for a, a, a film, film director. Film, yeah, film Joseph director. Strick, yeah. So tell me about how did this happen, that you purchased the house, how did you restore it? And I would like to also speak a little bit about your philosophy in restoration. Well, the thing that was really challenging about this project is that when we bought it, it was not Oscar Niemeyer uh, necessarily. A, a developer bought it and was going to demolish it, and the demolition permit went across the city of Santa Monica's desk. And somebody said, no, you can't demolish that, it's Oscar Niemeyer. And we, it, it got the status that you, you know you can't change it. Who are we gonna, who are we gonna find that's gonna not change this old house? And they were like, who are those crazy people that were in New York at the Rudolph House? You know, get a hold of them. <laughs> really, I mean, that's literally exactly it. I had a very strong sense. You know, I, I do have a photographic memory, and uh, I have ten thousand books, and so I'm like, I think I know that. And then sure enough. 1964, September Arts and Architecture, two pages, there's the house, Oscar Niemeyer. A writer from the LA Times went and saw Oscar Niemeyer, showed him pictures of our restoration. He said, oh, it's nice to finally meet this house. I wasn't able to see it. You know, I love that it's been restored to its 60s uh, elegance. Uh, what is your philosophy when coming to restore a house in terms of the materials? So where possible, I start with absolutely going back to its original state because like the finding the original furniture, this is all really about the search for authenticity. 
um, you know, I immediately try to get all of the uh, drawings, notes, ledgers, anything. You know, somebody like Neutra was absolutely meticulous and with every project, you know, had a book of that house with every single detail that is incredible. That's why I think the Neutra houses uh, survive. You know, with Rudolph, with Nehemiah, you have to fill in holes and, and when you're discovering something, excavating something that you didn't expect to find, that isn't indicated, you have to make guesses. And it's just like anything else, if you kind of absorb the language and you're able to mimic it, but really extrapolate and continue it, then it becomes easy of, you know, what, you know what's missing, what's the best, uh, you know, least invasive thing I can do here. So what's sure. the difference between the houses of these three architects? Yeah, I, I edited a book on Craig Elwood and uh, adore Craig Elwood. Uh, the reason I felt such an affinity to write that book was that I was restoring the uh, Steinman house from 1956 in Malibu and I had heard that, you know, he's not an architect, was never an architect, is kind of a you know, impresario kind of a character. And they said, well, there's no drawings survive. Uh, Craig Elwood never did any drawings. I opened a drawer, I pulled out these drawings. They were the craziest things I ever saw. It was like a child wanting to be an architect and not knowing perspective or scale or anything. They were just fantastic. I just sat in front of them for the longest time. They wanted me to put them in the book and I refused because I just, they were too crazy. But basically, I'm going to say he fashioned himself an architect. I think he's, you know, critical to understanding what happened in Southern California uh, at that time. Neutra is very different. You know, he's really kind of a genius. Quincy Jones, really a very capable architect and very interesting designer. Neutra, I think, is on another level. So in terms of real estate in, in Los Angeles, is there like, is there like a a price tag for those architects? Well, it's funny. I think it's the same as it probably is in the Hamptons or anywhere else that the final word is real estate value. So you'll find when the zip code is very, very expensive, but the architecture is avant-garde, it can be a problem. In LA, um, I want to say, sure, yeah, there's a little bit of a premium if it's an architect you can identify. Um, but not as much as you'd think. Uh, this was a very interesting project. This is where the house where I found those drawings in the, uh, the cabinet was built for a school principal who didn't have the budget for the steel, the structural steel that Elwood was pioneering and kept bugging uh, the Elwood office and uh, said, if you make it in wood and we make it modest, can we do it? It was built on a very small budget the client uh, came to me and said, now what if you had a big budget? And we, you know, I said, well, you cannot touch the house. You can't change the house. Can we add a second floor? I was like, no. Can we add one little appendage? No. Can you do this? No. I was really like, absolutely not. But I was, I did put in the pool. This is my first structure I designed from the ground up because there's a good example of get it away from the house and don't make it like Craig Elwood. So, Michael, this house actually here, can you say something about that? You were living here? Yeah. We, until very recently. Yep. We, we, this this was, is why I met you. Yes. That's, yep. You came right to that door. Yeah. And, um, you know, this was uh, really interesting because, you know, Quincy Jones, uh, this was uh, his second house, his first house for a client, which had a lot of features from his own house. So he... Uh, was, uh, you know, friends with Paul Williams, uh, who was doing the Beverly Hills Hotel at the same time. And they were going back and forth uh, to each other's projects. Um, he was, uh, you know, very cultured, um, you know, uh, friend of uh, the Eameses. And um, it's, it's just a very unusual expression of... Um, you know, modernism that is that is not just a simple box and not just this kind of crystalline structure of Neutra or Elwood. So can you just say something about how do you approach landscape design? I approach landscape design exactly the way I uh, 
approach all design. You know, if I don't have to do it, don't do it. So here, uh, Garrett Ekbo had done the landscape, and when we got there, the pool was buried, and we excavated and we found the pool. Uh, we tried to show them, hey, we just want to put the pool back. We're going to keep digging now. You, you know, it's not code anymore. We built the exact same pool that was uh, designed by Quincy Jones and Garrett Ekbo. So, you know, in my, in my introduction to you, I say that you're also a designer. And, and it's very unexpected that you moved from being a collector to being a designer. And so what is it like designing chairs? You design rugs. I, you know, it started as just exercises. Uh, you know, I never said I'm going to be a designer, but you know, when I'm looking for vintage things, and we all know, uh, when we're, you know, a client says, "Oh, I'd love that chair. Can do you have a set of eight? And I'm like, "No, there's just the one." I mean, one one thing that's interesting about my music career is that um, I was I kind of specialized in historic recordings, so including the patina on the recording. You know, if uh, uh, Nike comes to me and says, hey, we went to Peter Gabriel, he wants a million dollars for this track, we can't use it, we've already edited to it. My job is to not only kind of copy Peter Gabriel's essential idea without getting sued for plagiarism, but the most important thing is to go further to make sure it's an original idea. And I like things that are right on that crux of like, okay, that's the original idea. You know, so many people, of course, come up, oh, that's Rietveld. I'm like, well, it's Rietveldian, of course. I don't ever hide my sources, but I am very interested in kind of design paradigms when I see that more could be done right there. You know, if we really think of it as a, you know, chemical chart, and it, it you know, it's filling in the gaps, really. And, and where do you produce your furniture? All in LA. I do rugs for Christopher Farr that all start with paintings. Um, so uh, again, I would say my pursuing, you know, easel painting is exactly like designing a chair. You know, I should be more afraid and not venture there, but I like the challenge is really what I like is the challenge of going into the most populated, you know, and I've talked to so many architects, oh, a chair, uh, you know, another chair. And I would say it's the same with, with uh, the paintings. You do know, you, how, how do, can I use minimal expression to achieve something new? Okay, I would like to uh, start taking some questions from you. I really appreciate your reflections and your process. Oh, thank so you. So it's very insightful, thanks. Thank you. Um, you mentioned in the, at the top of your talk that you were working on the Schindler House, perhaps, or a Schindler building in Los Angeles. Uh, yeah, I've done several. Um, and I was just curious about the Schindler, Schindler House itself, like the current state. Um, of the actual of, Schindler House on King's? Perhaps some of the plainer schizophrenia that's going on in that building in relation to Rudolph. Maybe you have some. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting to get to know the the visual language and the structural language of the architect, how they would resolve just the way a composer, how would they finish this cadence? You know, how would this architect approach skin versus structure? Skin is structure. Uh, you know, uh, so many of the Schindler examples, I would say is he, he's, he's probably a really good source to look at the execution where in the period photographs it looks incredible, but by the time 30, 40, 50 years has gone by, you know, everything is cupping, everything is moving. It's an involved thing. But yeah, he, he, his temperament, I would say, is more like Rudolph's. I would say, you know, slightly more, you know, impatient with the details. Hi, thank you so much. I also love chairs and I'm obsessed with chairs. And I'm just wondering, what's your favorite place to sit in your own home? Favorite place to sit? Well, um, if we're not moving the chairs around, um, I love sitting in the Neymar chairs in the living room. You know, what's funny, if you're a chair fanatic, you know, you realize, well, I can't look at the one I'm sitting in. So this one's really comfortable. <laughs> oh, that's pretty good. So what I really like to do, it's such a meta concept, but you know, you sit in one chair and look at another. So I probably like to sit in my Vasily chair and look at the back of my Molino chair. Chairs uh, are so utilitarian and there can be so much more than utility 
You know, there can be utopia in the utility. Michael, wow. Thank you. Thank you. And welcome thank to you. New York. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you. Have a great evening.